those of us who have had the privilege and blessing of being reared in homes that were godly, where members of those homes were members of the church, and blessed to be able to be with sound, faithful congregations, and therefore sound preaching, have often heard the term, the age of accountability. I don't know how many articles I've read over the years or sermons I've heard that have mentioned that term, the age of accountability. And they would always mention it from the standpoint of a person sinning. A person must reach the age of accountability. And of course that accountability is for your actions before God. Before you can be a sinner. I mentioned not long ago that in the false doctrine of Calvinism that says that when you're born into this world, you just inherit the original sin Adam committed as you inherit the color of your hair or your eyes, that they have no idea of the age of accountability because you're born in this world uh, guilty of sin. Well, the Bible teaches no such thing. The Bible teaches that one must develop, mature to a certain age. Not necessarily a chronological age, but to a certain age of maturity. To be accountable before God for their actions. It's that point that one sins. Paul said in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And in Romans 6, 23, he says, The wages of sin is death. Death means separation. It doesn't mean annihilation. It doesn't mean that um, you're going unconscious when you go through the process of dying. It means you're separated from God by your sins. And that you cannot be saved except that your sins are remitted. Or God forgives you your sins. Now, we're concerned as parents... And I'm sure our parents, if they were concerned about spiritual things, were concerned for us. And young people ought to be concerned about when they reach this age of accountability. But out of all of the studies that I've seen, and maybe there's been some somewhere, I've never seen <clears throat> much of an effort on the part of anybody to explain what is this thing, the age of accountability. How can you tell you've reached it? And I think there's much more to it than most people realize. So in this sermon, we will study at what point people become accountable to God for their actions. And I hope all here will listen, but especially those young people who are not Christians, and especially the parents of those young people, but really all need to understand this. First of all, I want us to realize that we're talking about the maturity of the inward man, your spirit, that which is made in the in the image of God. Now, of course, you mature physically and mentally, and that helps you, that guides you, that strengthens you, that makes it possible so that you will assimilate knowledge and understanding and so forth. And all of that has a bearing on this. But I want us to look at this from the standpoint of what is the inward man? What is the real you that dwells in this body? That when you die, will go back into eternity. And we usually speak, as the Old Testament does, of the heart of man. To sum it up rather quickly, the inward man or the heart of man has to do with um, the intellect, where your rational powers are. It has to do with your conscience the highest court of your being, that on the basis of the standard that the intellect has within it, it says you're right or you're wrong, feel good in doing what's right, as the standard says, feel bad when you violate that standard. That's the conscience. There are the emotions whereby we display happiness and sorrow. And we need to understand all those things have a part. And of course we mentioned the area of the inward man that's educated, where there's intellectual and so forth. There's the will of man. I will do this, I will not do that. I choose to do thus and so. 
And we have to understand the age of accountability based upon these things. Now, as to whether we will be able to cover it sufficient for you, that's another story. But we'll do our best because I, frankly, have never had uh, presented, as I said a moment ago, uh, very much on just what is the age of accountability and how do you know you've reached it. The first factor that I want to look at is the emotional makeup of a person. And I want to say also, as we look at this, we'll look at about three. The last one's compound, but emotions, knowledge, <coughs> motive, and conscience. And that's the way we'll approach this. Emotions, knowledge, and the third one is compound, motive, and conscience. Now, if you look at the dictionary definitions, if you put them all together, you'll come up with something like this when it comes to the definition of human emotion. An effective state of consciousness in which joy, sorrow, fear, hate, or the like is experienced. As distinguished from cognitive and volitional states of consciousness. Usually accompanied by certain physiological changes. As increased heartbeat, respiration, or the like. And often overt manifestation is crying, shaking, or laughing, or some other type of display of emotion physically. The, this definition then suggests that emotional states often can and will and have displaced our intellectual rational powers. However, although such may be the case with most of humankind at one time or another, since we are made in the image of God, that is that inward man that I mentioned earlier, the spirit, there always remains the possibility that even under the most severe emotional strain, the ability to exercise freely our will to do what is right and reject what is wrong is there. A lot of people nowadays just don't see the relationship of one's will to carrying out the standard they've been taught in their intellectual rational powers and keeping their emotions under control. A lot of people just let their emotions carry them wherever they go. The Bible teaches us that we're not to be mere creatures of passion, mere creature, uh, creatures of emotion. That's not easy to do. Oftentimes, <clears throat> we can realize something to be the case on the basis of the facts we brought into our mind through proper study. But bringing our emotions under the sway of what we intellectually know is quite another thing. Maybe it would be likened to a terrible wound on the arm. I know where to go to get help. I go to get the help. The doctors, nurses, etc. take care of it. But it takes a while for that arm to heal. In the process of it healing, I'm awful biased toward that arm. <laughs> so it is intellectually, or I should say inwardly, mentally as we normally say it, you can know the facts in the case. You can understand how to reason with them and come to a conclusion. But if your emotions have not been exercised, that is, you haven't brought them under the control, you still may not handle those facts as if you were just coldly objective and with no emotions. Your emotions are meant for you to control on the basis of what? On the basis of the standard. So when you read your Bible, that's going in the intellectual part of you. You need to understand then that God expects you to control your emotions with the truth that you learn from God's revealed will. I think of 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and you see the very purpose for having it on this earth. 
All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, which means spiritually complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Well, part of that every good work is to get yourself aligned like you're made and not let your emotions run away beyond and set aside what you K-N-O-W know. That's intellectual and rational. So our emotional states be controlled. If you look at a number of the commandments, uh, you'll see that they dealt with the necessity of keeping your passions under control. We are instructed not to murder, commit adultery, steal, covet, and covet our neighbor's possessions. Therefore, it's evident that part of maturing, now get this, part of it, part of it I say, that part of maturing to this age of accountability to where you're to a state in this life where you're accountable to God for your actions and thus you sin or separate from God, part of it, I say, has to do with our passions and the control of them and maturing so you can do so. Folks, if you're thinking, you begin to see one of the great responsibilities of parents when it comes to educating their children and what it means to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now try to do that without knowing God's Word. You just can't do it. So anyone who has ever watched little children play has seen how strongly their behavior is strictly uh, dictated by their emotions. Just watch it around here and you'll have full evidence of that without having to go to any book or any laboratory. This is as good a laboratory as you can find. Let me give you a particular point. I've seen it in every church building I've ever worked in. At the end of the services, little children make a beeline for this podium. Now tell me why they do that. I have no idea. I don't know what there is about this podium. I don't know if it's because they see somebody standing up here and talking and maybe they want to see what it's like. I don't know what it is. But they do. Every child I've ever been around will come climbing these steps. And if the steps go as high as this ceiling, they'll climb those. And you see parents, hopefully, saying, you know, come down, this, 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 this. I'm not going to tell you which little child I saw, but this last Wednesday night, I almost laughed at the end of the services. We've been visiting for a long time. And one of the little ones started coming up these three steps. And I wasn't necessarily paying attention. I happened to look, saw him and looked at him, and he happened to see me. And he started saying, no, no, don't climb. No, no, don't climb. <laughs> and he backs back down. Does that tell you anything? I didn't say a word and didn't think about that. But I, he was looking at me and said, no, no, don't climb. I wish some of the brethren a little older would remember the sermons preached and say, no, no, I can't do that. Well, if you've watched them, you've observed and learned some things. One child might desire the toy of another child. And he doesn't mind if he wants it bad enough of taking that toy by force from the other child. And we've all witnessed that. Now, although these are actions that we hope later in life uh, they'll be overcome before later in life, really. But if they're not overcome, they'll turn into coveting, they'll turn into stealing, and that child has sinned. The child is not sinned at this point because his knowledge is limited. Purely passionate responses are expected with children, although they must be corrected through discipline. Considering emotions. Someone is, has said that one's emotional state is the sum total of all of his or her experiences coupled with the manner in which a situation is perceived. Now, that may be a little bit too sophisticated to comment. Let's see if we can illustrate it. And I know some of you men will appreciate this. You see the emotional state of one who is giving a speech before any size audience for the first time. Alan, remember that? For the very first time. Jeff, remember that? Well, and why would I call these two? I know something about these two men for the first time. Philip? 
Do you remember the time when you'd never done any of these things publicly and somebody was trying to get you to? What was going through your mind? It's mostly emotion. It's mostly emotion. You weren't going to stand there and say, I'm too dumb. I don't, I, I'm so ignorant, I can't tell anybody anything. It's emotion. And some of you took a good while before you got that emotion under control. And you got up here or somewhere and you did it. Now, because this person's experience is limited, there will normally be a great deal of anxiety which will manifest itself with increased heart rate, sweaty palms, shaking, a dry mouth, and most people will perceive such a situation as an occasion of fear, stage fright, and, and they will avoid it. But some of us who've been certain places others haven't been see things in people they don't see with themselves, and we don't let you alone. Uh, by the way, I just define parents right there dealing with children. Most people will perceive such situation and because they do fear to one extent or the other and we know they're apt to avoid it, we have a responsibility not to let them alone. But after a person develops experience in speaking, in this case, this illustration, publicly, the perception of the event begins to change. And you start seeing these fellows looking forward and to the time they're going to speak and they start saying I want to speak this I want to deliver this message on that and they begin to shove that old fear back behind them the physical reaction will be one of control rather than being controlled by the emotion or the fear thus the experience gained coupled with the new perception dictates the emotional state now who is it that has a greater responsibility to deliver a more polished, a more clear, a more rational, a more scriptural, as far as the sermon's concerned, an effective sermon. The person who stands up for the first time with his pants dead shaking and his mouth so dry and he's prepared this lesson for a month and it lasts about three minutes and he thought surely it would last 20, maybe 30. Who is it? That person or the person that for 10 years has done this thing and is quite comfortable? Although I can tell you now, that anybody that knows they're going to present God's Word and has studied it well enough to present it and thinks the people need it, always has that little bit, I don't know what they call it, anxiety or flutter, that says, now have I got it down right? And can I say it in a way that if the people listen, they'll get the message. Winston Churchill said regarding making speeches, if you ever lose any of that little flutter just before you get up there, the speech won't be worth anything. So there's always a little bit, but it's a mature self-control thing because we call it experience. The more experienced individual has the greater responsibility. Would you agree with that? I think we wouldn't about anything we see. He has had the opportunity to develop the emotional control necessary in delivering a more effective speech. This person is therefore accountable for the outcome of his speech in a way that the person first getting up there wouldn't be. This person uh, that's speaking for the first time is really not accountable in terms of being ineffective. But we certainly realize the two are at different stages. Now, if we mere humans can realize that, and in realizing that makes a difference in their accountability to this audience and what we expect of them, what about the God who knows all and observance of us and this business of the age of accountability and when you reach it? So the role of emotional maturity plays in, I didn't say it's all it is to it, I said it plays into ones reaching that age of being accountable to God. That's spiritual accountability. And we need to know that. Children who take toys and desire someone else's things have not sinned because they've not developed the necessary emotional control to bring about accountability. It's not the only thing, but we're in the area of emotion right now. 
when we consider one's accountability for actions, then we must consider the emotional maturity of that individual. And because of this factor, it's impossible to determine the precise chronological age that fits all people in all situations because people mature at different rates emotionally. Now that's what I want to say about emotion as it relates to when one reaches this age of being accountable to God for our actions and thus sinning. The second one has to do with knowledge and we'll call it our second factor that figures into this. When we speak of experience and its effect on one's emotional state, we're really ta talking of, of knowledge. Knowledge is defined, if you look at all the dictionaries, it'll come up something like this, as acquaintance with facts, truths, or principles, as from study or investigation. All that has been perceived or grasped by the mind, learning, enlightenment. There is knowledge we gain from experience, experiential knowledge, empirical knowledge. Remember, that's the science area. Through the five senses we examine this world. And then there's knowledge gained through contemplation. And that's where we say if this is the case and this is the case, then logically this is the case. It's not something you observe with the five senses. And this usually is the area of logical philosophy. This is what a jury does in a court case where the evidence is presented. They never saw the person do anything. They don't know whether the person is innocent or guilty. How are they going to determine it? Adequate evidence, critical witnesses, honest hearts, making a decision based upon those things. There's particular knowledge that's able to save our souls, according to 2 Timothy 3 and verse 15. And of course we want to know this because we want our souls saved from sin and eventually saved in heaven. Hopefully parents will teach their children the scriptures and that they will develop the necessary knowledge that can only come through proper knowledge of the Bible. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that he did not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. And if Timothy could learn the scriptures from his grandmother and his mother, need I say more? By the way, daddy's not even mentioned in that. However, attaining a certain level of scriptural knowledge, listen to me, does not indicate that one has reached the age of accountability. Necessary, but doesn't by itself indicate it. Many children can tell the story of the gospel and even cite verses concerning salvation and they can say, B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. They can say, that's God's word. They can do more than that. Young children can often understand that obedience is essential to eternal life. They can know that. Yet simply having the information does not make a person accountable for his actions. In order for one to be accountable for the knowledge of right and wrong, one must possess, there must be the capacity of reasoning correctly. Have you ever noticed how many times it said in the book of Acts concerning Paul's preaching? It didn't say preached, although at other times it did. But in these cases it said a concerning reasoning of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come. That's what he was doing when he spoke. And so it focused on what he was doing, not the method of delivery of the word. To reason correctly, one must have the ability to look at acquired facts as well as other information and competently arrive at conclusions based on the proper information. This has to do with the area of knowledge that we call, as I said earlier, contemplation. What does it mean to contemplate a matter? It's to think it through. It's to think rationally. A child can recite facts regarding the gospel, but he cannot conclude that ending, for example, will constitute the actual breaking of God's law and cause an unrepentant soul to be lost forever and ever in the devil's hell if he dies in that way. A person develops reasoning skills throughout life. 
as to when those reasoning skills are capable of saying, coupled with the other matters we're studying, that that person's accountable to God for his actions, does not happen when the person, every person, every person, male and female, reaches 12 years old chronologically. It just doesn't. It's when one matures to the point of reason that he or she is accountable for the knowledge they've acquired. In fact, some religious groups refer, and not just religious groups, but this age of accountability is the age of reason. So then concerning knowledge, little children may acquire it and not be accountable to God for it. Knowledge must be coupled with the ability to reason. Emotional maturity and be guided by our motives in order for us to be accountable to God for our actions. And that brings us into the third factor. We've compounded it, motives and conscience. We are driven by our motives. We are driven by our motives. If someone wants to quit smoking, they must develop the motivation to quit smoking. Or they just might as well not try. But you mentioned today about, uh, about dieting. There's no use trying to diet, folks, unless you've made up your mind. Unless you have that motivation that causes your mind to come together and resolve, this I will do. And no person has continued the habit of smoking against his will. Now, you let that sink in. Motive, in many ways this is true, motive and will are synonymous. Motive defined as something that prompts a person to act in a certain way or that determines volition incentive. If somebody comes up to you with a shotgun and pokes it in your nose, and there's about four or five people he's already shot right down there, and says, either you do this and so, or you're going to be like those folks. Now you have the will to say, Shoot away. But I know what you're strongly tempted to do, and I know why. Because your motive now is encouraged in a great way. But you still must will to do it. And your motive can be a higher one than that if something, somebody's saying, I'm going to blow your head off unless you deny Christ. You can have a higher motive than that. But nevertheless, they're coupled. Maybe not exactly the same thing, they are coupled. A person who has not reached the point in his life where he is able to direct his motive or will is not yet accountable for actions. The foundation of our motives is our passion, it's our knowledge. A child can understand the command, stay out of that cookie jar. A child can understand the threat a punishment for violating this command if there's still anything like that ever threatened therefore the child is accountable for disobeying the command and is justly punished a child may desire a cookie yet that desire can be overcome by the fear of punishment his motive is thereby directed by both emotional desire as well as knowledge of the punishment. The child might choose to disobey and eat the cookie. Well, if that's the case, the decision is made based upon the desire for the cookie and in spite of the punishment that is sure to come. Whatever the child does, and this is the point, he does it because he wants to. And we talk about the strong-willed child, and we talk about that child being bullheaded, just like his mother. A little baby who, who does not understand language or the threat of punishment cannot be held accountable for eating that which is forbidden. Such a child is incapable of controlling his passion for food. Now you try on a month old baby to reason with it, to wait just a minute. We'll get it ready. Just be patient. Try that. And that goes on through six months and a year and two years and three years. And as the child develops, then you meet him where he has developed to. And if you don't, you're in for trouble. 
and that's the reason the nation's in for trouble. As an infant grows into a toddler, he develops the capacity to make the choice to obey the cookie command or disregard it. The child then becomes accountable to his parents for his actions. This, I think, simple little example should also serve to illustrate the role of will and motive in determining the age of accountability to God. Because we can grow in every one of those. When a person has spent years developing emotionally and has learned what is right morally and what is wrong morally, they then have the necessary requirements of a free moral agent. Therefore, in order for one to be accountable for sin, he must have reached the point in life in which he can choose between moral good and evil. Now, as to how these people develop in these things we mentioned is going to determine how fast they reach that. Listen to me. Fifty years ago to a hundred years ago back, because of the responsibility and discipline and fundamental teaching, people reached it more quickly. Today, you have right the opposite going on. And you can have people 20 years old who are more like 13. Now, in every case, I'm not saying that the 20-year-old is not accountable to God. I'm not saying that. I'm trying to show that people can reach that age of accountability to God for their actions on the basis of these things going on in their lives. How else would you suggest they get there? Years ago in the third world countries and developing nations, when we would try to study with correspondence courses, study the Bible with people, we were told by the folks, this was years ago, that don't expect out of a 15 or 16 or 17 year old the same thing there that you would here. Because they just have not developed due to every one of these things I mentioned to the point to where they are thinking like most 17 or 18 year olds do. They are slower in reaching maturity in these levels and that reflects upon their ability to be accountable to God. Now if you're saying well it must be at 16 then instead of 12. I can't draw any chronological line. All I can say in this nation there's very little in the populace as a whole that's encouraging any self-control and emotion, any furtherance of knowledge, any exercise of the will to self-discipline, and you can therefore just expect it to be later before they're fully accountable to God for their actions. Now, if you say, well, I don't believe all that, all right, what do you believe? Of course we preach the word. Of course we sow the seed of the kingdom, as the song said. But that seed's only germinated in that heart that's called honest and good. And I suggest when you look at Luke 8, 15, that honest and good heart, it has all of these qualities that we've been talking about in it. Because as we've said, Christianity is a taught religion. He that believeth and is baptized is not said to the six-month-old. Because he's not capable of understanding it. Why? Because of the things I've been saying. Parents need to understand that when it comes to rearing their children. If they don't, they're going to have children much older chronologically, but less than that in their mental maturity, in their emotional maturity. Now, I want you to see something. To be in order, for one to be accountable for sin to God, then he must have reached the point in life in which he can choose between moral good and evil. I remind you of that again because I want you to see something. The very same choice was before Eve back there in the garden. Now we know she sinned. The infallible word of God says she sinned. We know sin's a transgression of the law. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. She wanted to be like God. The devil said she would be. She believed him. Notice it involved understanding what the devil said. Contrasting it with what the Lord said. And desiring to believe the lie, the falsehood, that the devil said. Now look at her maturity. She wanted to be like God, yet she knew that to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil would be in violation of God's positive law. She had the power to eat or not to eat. In her judgment, the desire to be like God was greater than the prohibition made by God. She did exactly what she wanted to. She had the maturity to control her emotional desires. She had the ability to understand, to reason as to the consequences of violating God's prohibition. 
She knew that it would be displeasing to God. In order to sin, she had to violate God's command and to go against her own conscience. In violating her conscience and breaking God's law, she encountered the guilt of sin. Now it's at that point in which she did those things that she shows the example whereby we can understand the point that a person reaches, as we've been discussing, to be accountable to God for his actions. It's at this point in which one becomes consciously aware of moral good and evil and therefore become accountable for their actions. Now this then can occur at different chronological ages. The conscience will develop, if you want to call it that, at a faster rate for those who've been given moral guidance all their life. One will have fully reached the age of accountability when they experience the guilt that follows the violations of one's conscience. This guilt is not exactly the same as shame. Sometimes we use shame and guilt synonymously. But I'll show you. Shame can be experienced by one who's not yet accountable. As parents and teachers, we must see the difference between shame, and I'm defining my terms so you'll see I'm making a difference, uh, shame and the remorse that precedes or proceeds from guilt. A child who has done something that should not have been done may be made to be ashamed of it. Not necessarily accountable for actions though. And should not be encouraged to be baptized or washed of sins when they don't exist. Every preacher I know of has had somebody come with a four year old in hand and say I just think he needs to be baptized. I just think, and I've asked them sometimes, if you died now, would you burn in hell before the night's over? And of course, they have a fit that you ask them that bluntly. And the little child said, no, but I want him baptized. No wonder, if the, if, the, if the parent can't think any better than that, no wonder the child's in a mess. That says a lot about a lot of things. So what's the age of accountability? Well, it's a term that needs to be defined. It needs to be explained because it can mean anything to anybody. And we need to define it, uh, hopefully, something like we've done here today. The term age seems only confuse a lot of folks, so we need to explain that. What needs to be studied is this. At what point has one matured to the level that he or she will be accountable for his actions? And it takes all these things I've been mentioning as to when that point is reached. Is it 10? Is it 12? Is it 13? You can't measure it by chronological things. The physical age of an, an individual is not then really relative to such a discussion. As a parent, hopefully, what we've learned from this study is a few basic principles that will help us instill in our children the right motives for their actions. It is inevitable that our children will at some point sin. And drive a nail down there. When they experience the guilt of that sin, I say the guilt of that sin. They need to know what to do about it. Now I want to speak to the young people. If you've understood what I've said today, and especially this last point, that sin's a transgression of the law, that you sin, and right now in your mind you know you're guilty of sin, you need to obey the gospel before you leave here this morning. You are accountable to God for what you believe. And if you die right now, accountable to God, knowing you have the guilt of sin, you will go straight to damnation. Is there anything about that you don't understand? And it's not because we hate you, brethren. It's not because we hate those who are not Christians. It's because we want them to give the honest, proper evaluation of their heart when they hear the word of God, the seed of the kingdom, the power of God to save, and that they will honestly, honestly receive it, make the proper evaluation. And when that old guilt of sin, knowing that you're separated from God, works in you, you'll simply, when the invitation is offered, rise up and immediately obey the gospel with the determination to live the rest of your life in favor with God. I don't know what a sermon's worth if it's not to cause a person in some way or the other to benefit spiritually from it. There's no doubt about it. You will know when you sin if you're honest with yourself and with God. And when you first feel the pangs of a guilty conscience, you need to respond to the gospel in humble obedience. Now, if you don't, 
That even fur further proves because your will is not to do what you admit has caused you guilt. The guilt of sin. The lost condition. Now what are you going to do about it? Are you going to sit there and not respond to the truth and know that if you leave this building, you die, you're gone. Mom and daddy can't come get you. They may have snatched you out of everything else trying to keep them growing up. They will not be able to snatch you out of their hands of God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. For as the Hebrews writer further said, our God is a consuming fire. Folks, we're doing all we can to get you to realize about yourself what you are before God and to honestly evaluate your life. Now, I want to know why you won't respond to the gospel invitation. And as God searches your mind, his prayers are sin, then we earnestly beg you on bended knee to obey the truth of the gospel right now while together we stand and sing this song.